uh, sadly, the criminal justice people, police, and it's really important for us as parents and caregivers and certainly for people themselves who are living with FASD to be able to, to claim that we know about our lives. We know what we deal with day to day. And so that's something that I certainly advocate for in the community when I'm working in schools or working with police is, is to kind of, if I can, and, and as parents, if you can, to get those professionals to stop and listen and and acknowledge that in fact we are experts when it comes to our own uh, children youth and and adult children and then my second declaration is absolutely i do not have all the answers and i don't want to pretend that i have all the answers a lot of what we're dealing with when we're working with our loved ones is uh, trial and error and what may work for one child or youth or, or adult won't necessarily work with another so I think it's really important for us to know, you know, Catherine said we have ongoing learning here and we can ask questions at the end of the seminar. The reality is, is we have ongoing learning right to the end of life with um, our loved ones and with ourselves as parents and caregivers. Um, so I just want to put that out there. And I guess I also want to say when you do ask questions this evening, it's very difficult for me to answer um, specific uh, questions about a specific child youth or adult child because I don't know all the background so I I'm going to present in a general manner tonight and if some of you have questions that might be more relevant to your own situation I will probably still answer in general terms because I want to be careful that I don't inadvertently give advice without really having the whole background. So I hope um, you're all okay with that. Um, so next slide, Catherine. So really the goals of this session is, is I'm hoping that I'll leave you with a good or a better understanding of mental illness as it relates specifically to FASD, what are the links and why, and that you'll be able to identify or, or recognize red flags so that um, if one of your loved ones is dealing with mental illness, you'll, you'll pick up on it a little more quickly, hopefully, and also how to respond to it, um, especially in times of crisis. And there are, as I said already, lots of things we can do proactively to support our children, youth, and adults with mental health. And I think sometimes, um, uh, I don't know what happened there, Catherine, we flipped back. Um, I think sometimes as we share information and learn about FASD, it gets overwhelming and we feel as parents, you know, it's hopeless. And I really want to leave you overall with the message, it's not hopeless. There are things we can do. And um, I want you, and you already recognize it, but more maybe on a gut level, to recognize the complex relationship between FASD and mental health. And there is, um, of course, especially all of those who, who have adopted children or fostering or kin, we always have to be cognizant of the fact that there's often attachment uh, and, and trauma kind of on top or concurrently or initially and then the diagnosis of FASD and sometimes then the secondary um, outcomes of mental health issues. So I will touch on attachment and trauma but really to a limited degree because that's a whole other webinar in itself but I don't think we could talk about mental health if we don't really look at the fact that a lot of our uh, loved ones are also dealing with that initial attachment and and you know the, the trauma from adverse childhood experiences and and the most number one strategy is for you to understand that the key to success not just for our loved ones for all of us as human beings but still in terms of people with FASD um, the key to success is building relationships. So starting in, you know, the family unit, whatever that may look like, reaching out to neighbors, friends, community, professionals, uh, as many people as we can include in their circle of care. Um, and it seems simple, but it's really key to um, ensuring success in life for 
for our loved ones. So just building relationship um, is always a key message that I try to impart. So those are the goals of the session. Um, and I hope that it'll, it'll um, cover it in a, in a good solid way for you. Next slide, please. So how I want to really start is looking at what is mental health and mental illness. And, and I think we sometimes throw it out there. You know, we say, oh, someone has mental health issues and or mental illness. And we use those interchangeably. But there, there is some uh, difference in terms of the definitions. So when, when I'm talking about... Um, uh, mental illness, and we, we look at the, the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, we're now on, into the fifth edition, they kind of break down some of the mental illnesses into specific areas. So you'll see here mood disorders, which often um, uh, look at depression or bipolar disorder, or you'll hear major depressive um, the second category, anxiety disorder, so GAD or generalized anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic attacks or specific phobias like agoraphobia. Lots of times our loved ones really are not comfortable leaving their safe environments, be that the, their home and or their bedroom or in school, their specific classroom or safe corner, safe spot, it's, it falls into that phobia. And then externalizing disorders. So those are the, the disorders that we often see are presented or manifest outwardly. Oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder. The biggest one is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So they call those externalizing disorders because often what we're seeing is the behavior, the acting out, which is a term that I personally don't like. Um, but you, you hear that in all the, you know, in schools, in, in community settings, oh, that's a child or a teen who's acting out. They're not acting out. They're trying to express through behavior, what their needs may be. So often it's, it's seen as a negative kind of um, manifestation of whatever the mental health is. And then there's another category, which we look at substance abuses, sleep disorders, reactive attachment disorder. So those are some of the categories. And, and lots of us will look at that list and go, wow, my child or youth or adult child has many of them, all of them, some of them. And one of the things that uh, happens with FASD is sometimes uh, people are diagnosed with all a variety of other disorders. We call them, it's a cascading or uh, the, um, the skittles uh, of, of diagnoses. And that's certainly what happened with my youngest son. You know, by the time he was eight, he was attention deficit. Uh, general anxiety disorder, uh, he had uh, severe anxiety, he was considered possibly conduct, he definitely had sleep issues, you know, there, there was this list, and I re remember parents kind of saying to the psychiatrist one day, like, how many labels can one little kid have? And that was actually what triggered my thought of there's something different going on. There's something bigger and they're just slapping kind of label after label. And in fact, that's when I started pursuing the possibility of FASD because sometimes um, that's what it is. And, and these are secondary or tertiary outcomes of, of FASD. Next slide. Any questions around that? We'll see what happens. So, so the difference really between the definition of mental health and mental illness is that with mental health, we all have mental health issues. Really, um, everyone in the world has mental health issues, whether it's stress at work or, you know, worries about finances or again being a caregiver to somebody with FASD or any other type of developmental disability, physical disability, maybe there's marital issues, all those kind of day-to-day -day life issues tie into mental health. So when we 
think of mental health, it includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. So it looks, it really affects, or we look at how do we think, how do we feel, how do we act, um, and how we think and feel and act actually determines how we end up ha handling stress or how we relate to other people, how we engage with people in our own families, in our communities, um, you know, all across the board, whether it's at church or, you know, our child's guide or scouting community, what, you know, just all the social circles that we're in. So mental health really, it, it impacts, it happens at every stage of our life, all the way from actually even now we're learning more and more what happens in utero. We're learning that um, a, a mom who is really stressed prenatally, often the child has um, stress in the womb. So, so so definition here says from childhood, but I would even say from the point of conception and adolescence through adulthood all the way into our senior and end of life years. So it's something that we all deal with every day. So when you think about that, our thinking, our mood, our behavior be affected by all of those different factors that can contribute to our mental health overall. So we look at biological factors, you know, genetics, our brain chemistries. We look at temperament, how, how we're born, what our personality is like. I've added because of the topic tonight, FASD. It impacts um, how we think and feel about ourselves as people. You know, so our children, and again, I'll give a concrete example here. I remember, you know, uh, one day asking my youngest son to tell me about his brain. I said, tell me what you, you think about your own brain. And I think he was about six or seven. I'm not exactly sure. He was quite young. And initially he got angry and he said to me, there's nothing wrong with my brain. My brain is normal. Leave me alone. I don't want to talk about it. But about three days later, he came to me and he said, Mom, you know, when you asked me about my brain, I said, you know, yes, I did. He explains, my brain is the loneliest brain in the world. And he, he was holding his head when he said that to me. That's mental health. He was expressing that how alone he felt and how different he felt. That's mental health. And then obviously our life experiences, and for those of us, um, you know, who maybe have adopted an older child, uh, where there's, let's say, longer years of trauma or um, adverse childhood experiences, things like that. But again, we are learning more and more about how prenatally, um, you know, whether you're eating well, whether you're smoking, certainly in the, in the case of FASD, the prenatal exposure to alcohol, all those things have an impact of, of trauma on the person who's being um, affected. So that has an impact on overall mental health. And then, you know, looking at a family history of mental health problems. If you're a child or a person who's being raised in a family of origin and or an adoptive family where there's a history of mental health and perhaps, you know, challenging um, having challenges of coping day to day with mental health, problem solving, uh, keeping order in the home, if things are chaotic, addictions, things like that. All of those factors contribute to overall mental health. Overall mental health, if it's not cared for over time, can then at times be um, crossing that line into mental illness, the manifestation of ongoing trauma, adverse experiences, attachment issues, things like that. Joyce, we do have a question for you. Okay. Um, someone has asked, I don't believe that ASD was one of the diagnoses that you had on your list. How often is it included in the spectrum of the disorders that are associated with FASD? Yeah, it's a good question, and it is often included. So again, um, you know, the few things that I listed are just examples, but that's an excellent question. And you can have, just as with any other um, disorder, you can definitely have concurrent disorders. So um, many of our people, for sure, are diagnosed on the um, autism spectrum, as well as 
uh, FASD and or any of the other kind of uh, disorders that I've listed there. Sometimes um, a person will be diagnosed first on the autism spectrum and there's a variety of reasons for that and unfortunately one of the main reasons is that there are more services more supports so um and and certainly again and i'll share you know my own personal experiences as i as i go along in in the early years i was actually asked several times uh, by a variety of professionals psychiatrists doctors and and um you know, therapists that my youngest boy had seen, why don't you just let us diagnose him with autism because you'll get services right away. And I really fought against that. It was like, if he has autism, great, I will go for that. If he does not, I don't want him just to have a label for the sake of services. I want him to have the right diagnosis so he gets the right or the most appropriate interventions that that is needed. So that's a great question. And it's something I think we do have to be open to because there always is the possibility of concurrent disorders happening. And some of the interventions and, and supports you would offer um, are quite similar and can be effective for, for both of those spectrum disorders. So it's, it's fine to, I think, be open-minded and go, okay, maybe there's more than just, just FASD going on here. I think we have to be open-minded um, because again, it does allow us to intervene in a whole variety of different ways. Does that answer your question? I think so. I'll keep an eye on if there's anything follow up just in case. Okay. We can go to the next slide then. So, so I talked earlier about how we kind of interchangeably use mental illness, mental disorder or psychiatric disorder. Um, they, they are interchangeable, but we just want to look at um, the subtle differences of what those definitions might be. But it, it mostly focuses on behavioral or mental patterns that in order to get the diagnosis of an illness or a disorder or a psychiatric disorder, there does have to be kind of significant impairment in personal function. So personal function would refer to what people um, call activities of daily living or instrumental or independent activities of daily living. And so when I'm working with families with FASD, I often will, as a strategy, so this is something you might want to write down as a parent, but when you're talking about what's happening for your loved one is to really focus on that word function. So a lot of times, um, you know, people with FASD have normal IQ, or, you know, average and, and often even above average IQ. So when we're trying to access a sort services, they sometimes fall between the cracks because they're not uh, meeting the criteria for developmental disability. But when you're talking to the people that you're needing services from, you want to use the word and, and kind of put it in their face a little bit. I'm not talking about intelligence. I'm talking about actual functioning, how somebody can actually apply what they know and make it practical. So giving an example of that, applying for... Um, you know, disability, uh, the disability tax credit, they ask, it's a, it's a ticky box questionnaire, can your child dress themselves? Well, yeah, technically they can, they can pull on their socks or button their shirt or, you know, pull their pants up, but they don't always functionally do so. So, so I would explain on that form that yes, uh, my child is able to, with cueing, pull on his pants. But if I actually don't cue him, then he may not put on his pants. <laughs> he may just walk out the door. In my son's case, it's socks. He will never, ever, ever put socks on, even if it's 40 below zero. So that is a function. So when you start breaking it down for people, they're able to go, okay, I'm getting what you're saying. So when we're looking at mental illness or where somebody's really moving from, you know, struggling to really having a mental illness, 
can somebody walk out the door? Yes, they can physically walk out the door, but they don't because their anxiety stops them. So they flop and drop on the floor. They may tantrum if they're, you know, in grade one, or they may lock the door to their bedroom if they're 15 and refuse to come out. So it's, it's how does it impact function? How does that child or youth get to school or, you know, uh, get to a hockey game or things like that? So, so really think about that and break that down when you're trying to share with with people in terms of getting support, what their actual day looks like. How does the, the activities of daily living happen? So um, again, we think about some of our sensory processing issues and the fact that um, um, you know, our children might not brush their teeth because they can't handle the feeling of the bristle in their mouth. And I don't know if any of you've ever experienced that where somebody's like, what do you mean your kid doesn't brush their teeth? And you're trying to explain it to them. That's about function. It's not because they don't want to. It's not because they don't know how. But then personal hygiene is affected, right? So it's the same thing with mental illness. What is happening in in their emotion, in their psyche, that's preventing them from you know, functioning in a way that if you want to use the term, the average person or the average teenager or the average, you know, grade one child would function. So think about it in, in that um, area. So when you're looking at disorders, usually what you're looking at is, is how the person behaves and feels and perceives or thinks. It's all combined together in terms of how somebody is functioning overall. So I guess, again, what I wanted to say in terms of, you know, I always put normal in quotes, but normalizing it is that mental health problems or illnesses, in fact, are quite common. And, and with the right supports and interventions, people can and they do get better or they learn how to manage and cope better. And for many people in terms of mental health, um, they they do recover fully with the right interventions. I just got a little message that my internet connection is unstable, so I hope I don't disappear on you or something. Um, it's you can go to the pretty good on our end so far, but if anything happens, I'll definitely um, step in. Okay, um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so the whole purpose of a diagnosis, sometimes I think in the community what we struggle with, and again, I certainly did as a parent, is that sometimes when people are looking for diagnosis, we panic and we, we get afraid and we think, well, my child or my teen, it, they're going to be labeled. And, and they're good questions to ask. What will happen if they're labeled? What will, you know, what will the outcomes be for, you know, how they're treated in the community, so on and so forth. But really the purpose of a diagnosis is on a clinical level is so we can try to understand what's actually happening for that person. And um, so whether that's a psychiatrist, a doctor, um, uh, you know, maybe a psychologist who's doing counseling with the family. They're trying to figure out what's happening in that person's psyche that's impacting in, in their day-to-day -day function. And then the next purpose really is to find a plan of intention or treatment that's effective to help, whether it's, you know, I think the goal is always, of course, towards full recovery, if that's possible, in terms of the mental health piece, but it's really to manage well, to, to minimize and or improve to whatever degree we can, the person's ability to function and have as high quality and or reach his or her personal potential uh, by being healthy in terms of their emotion and their, their psychology and their behaviors as, as best as possible. So it's not always a bad thing. You know, when, again, we think about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, it's a permanent brain injury. It affects whole body. There's often 
um, uh, you know, other physical problems that, that happen also as a result. And we know through research that people, for example, who struggle with pain or struggle with limitations on a chronic level are more apt to become depressed over time. They get discouraged over time. So how can we manage that or minimize it in such a way that they're able to enjoy their lives the best that they can and function to the best they can. That's a very individual uh, reason for diagnosis. So I mentioned earlier the DSM-5, which stands for Diagnostic Statistical Manual, and, and it's usually the criteria from there has to be met in order for any kind of formal diagnosis to, to be made. And so it's important to know the DSMs used to classify, in this case, the mental disorders or, you know, whatever diagnosis, psychiatric diagnosis somebody is getting. It does not classify the individuals. So that's an important distinction because um, every single person you know, and I say in the world, but every single person with ASD is unique and individual. And so we can't just lump everybody into one category or one classification. So, so just think about that as well. And we know for example, well, um, the 2015 Canadian guidelines for FASD now it is, is in the DSM-5 and you know, in order for somebody to be diagnosed with FASD, they have to have um, three out of the 10 uh, brain domains that may be affected um, and, and along with the uh, confirmation of, of prenatal exposure to alcohol. But in terms of of how it manifests, we're looking at these 10 brain domains, you know, memory, cognition, which looks at uh, perception and judgment and problem solving and things like that. So we are looking at a classification there, but we're not saying that every individual with FASD will have just three out of the 10. Some have six some have 10 out of 10, some have three, some have four. So they're all unique individuals. So when we're looking at diagnoses, it's really to get a sense of, you know, what that person might be dealing with, but it's not to try to classify them and put them in, you know, into a peg, uh, the, the pegged hole, because everybody's so different, right? So again, going back to um, trial and error and what works with one person may not work for another person. Um, so again, when we're looking at diagnoses, we're looking at the team maybe around the person. You are looking at your GP, at a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker, physio, occupational therapist, uh, teachers, you know, the, fa you know, the coach, um, anybody who's going to encircle your loved one and offer support. They become part of the team. And all those, those brains coming up with ideas of, let's try this, let's try that, what might work for this person. So think of it in, you know, on that level when you're thinking about a diagnosis. Can we move forward on the slide? Um, so yeah, I actually kind of just addressed this. So these are the 10, I won't read go slide but these are the the 10 brain domains that um, are looked at and um, a person has to have at least three out of the 10 as I mentioned some may have more um, you know some may have all of them and um, when they're doing testing and looking at things the definition really is it's equal to two or more uh, points or standard deviations in the formal testing and this can be frustrating sometimes for parents where um, you you go to, to uh, or you fight to get a diagnosis because often we do have to advocate and fight and um, um, your child may just be on the cusp or just just be on the fence and so um, you don't get the diagnosis and you're you know you want to pull your hair out you will now possibly get an at-risk uh, definition and what happens there is um, what the the assessor whether it's a psychiatrist doctor who's ever it's got to be a medical person who's making that 
diagnosis. They, they're they actually saying to you, you know, your, your person doesn't quite meet the criteria, but certainly we're seeing levels of risk in three or more of these brain domains. So we're going to say he or she is at risk. And in a year or two or three, you can go back for an updated assessment. And at that point in time, they may in fact um, get the diagnosis because often what happens is as a person um, gets older, you, kind of the gap between them and let's say again, uh, putting quotes, a normal child of the same age or teen of the same age, you'll see those those gaps in function widen as um, as they age. So so you know don't be too too discouraged, I guess, if you get that as at risk category, it is the way the professionals are acknowledging that yes, there are issues. Yes, there's a possibility of FASD, just not quite, you know, meeting the exact criteria to give a 100% sure diagnosis. So um, uh, don't be discouraged by that. Um, because it doesn't mean that your loved one would never have that diagnosis at some point. Okay, next uh, slide, Catherine. Um, so someone's just commented as well. So to, to have a confirmed diagnosis, do you have to yeah. have a confirmed um, fetal alcohol exposure? Yes. So yes, you do. And um, I think what people are working on is trying to make that um, how that confirmation comes through a little more flexible. If if there are clear indicators, let's say in, a, for example, a CAS file where uh, a worker has documented, you know, that um, alcohol was an ongoing issue and there was a high likelihood that um, this mother, you know, did drink, then yes. If, if you're dealing with a biological mom who, and actually I will quite openly share this too, because one of the things I want to be always really aware of or uh, aware of but also supportive of is it's not about blaming the biological mother so 40 to 50 percent of pregnancies in Canada are unplanned many many times women are drinking before they uh, know that they're pregnant and I've shared publicly that I was one of those women I have one biological child and and I had experienced uh, uh, infertility issues and had been told um, actually it's funny because I'm still waiting I was told by one doctor I would have a chance of winning the 649 twice big time more than I would ever, ever conceive a child. Um, I'm still waiting for the 649. It hasn't come in yet. I'm hopeful. But, um, you know, again, women experience that. So at the time, I was a frontline protection worker, and I was going to the doctor saying, I'm really exhausted. There's something wrong. I don't know what's going on. And because I already had that diagnosis of infertility, my doctor never offered a pregnancy test and I never thought to say I could be pregnant and what my doctor was telling me at that time was you know you're working at CAS go home have a glass of wine or two put your feet up relax so I was doing that I was four months pregnant uh, before I knew and you know I often share that story because um you know, I'm a well-educated woman. I, I have a really good background in the medical field as well. I had a nursing degree some years ago, you know, and it just never dawned on me I was pregnant. So, so in relation to that, trying to support and encourage um, um, a biological mom who may have um, used alcohol during pregnancy without knowing it, and or somebody who's really was struggling with significant addiction who was trying to get help but couldn't get into a program like again the complexity of how that happens so so the you know i i kind of digressed a little bit but i think it's really really important for us to uh recognize that you know there's there's really no woman out there who's going to um uh, purposely you know uh, drink knowing what the risks are. So we want to educate and, and support uh, um, biological parents as well as their 
struggling with it. So trying to get sometimes somebody to admit that yes, they did drink during pregnancy can be really, really tough because because there's still the stigma, and um, but but the criteria is there. There does need to be a known prenatal exposure to alcohol. So um, I know more and more workers on the front lines at, at CAS are trying to document that. Um, or if you're kin, um, in my case, my youngest boy is my grandson. I was very aware. Um, that uh, the biological mom was drinking and I had first hand knowledge, but I had to fight for that because she was not willing to share that she drank. So I just really, really pushed based on the fact that I was grandma and I had first hand knowledge. And initially they did not want to accept that because there's a potential for bias, they say, you know, uh, if you're wanting to, as a kin, maybe take on you know a child that's in your family circle but there's some little room for flexibility or loopholes but technically you need the uh, the known information of prenatal exposure to alcohol so we just have okay. um, another question says so just going back to the yeah. ASD so if if someone already has a diagnosis of ASD, is there any benefit to getting an FASD diagnosis if, if the treatments are similar? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. And, and I've been asked that directly as a parent. And, and personally, I think there is a, a important benefits. And I think the most important one is that often it changes the lens from which we as parents see our children with with fasd there are you know again specific or unique presentations um whether it's through behavior or emotions or verbal skills or sensory processing that are unique to fasd or unique to that particular person who has FASD slash and is also on the autism spectrum disorder. But I know that I know many parents who um, have expressed, and again, it goes back to our own mental health as caregivers. No matter what I do, nothing seems to be changing. No matter how much, you know, I try, no matter how many accommodations I'm doing, this child, and we become blaming, this child just won't uh, cooperate or this child just, you know, refuses to um, work and collaborate within the family. When you get that diagnosis of FASD and then you look at these 10 brain domains that are in front of you and you recognize it as a permanent brain injury, you know, their brain, if, if you want to take it down to really basic terms, their brain is broken. And so when they're not cooperating or when they're acting out or when they're overreacting, you know, to noise around them or uh, a crowded room or smells or whatever, and they flip out. When you have that diagnosis of FASD as a caregiver, as a parent, you're able often, I mean, we're human, so I'm not saying we're all perfect here, but you're able to step back and go, this is not purposeful behavior. This child or teen or adult is not, you know, again, that term, acting out in order to be difficult or in, in order to, to ruin your life or embarrass you publicly. This child or teen or adult is manifesting behaviors because they are distressed and they are trying to, in their own mind, make things work. So when you start looking at it from that lens, your heart softens, your attitude softens, your, you know, levels of frustration go down a little bit. You're less reactive yourself as a parent because, you know, you're not being, um, you're not thinking, oh my God, my child is just spoiled or um, determined or conduct disordered, you're, you're able to say to yourself, my child is really struggling with a physical 
brain injury that impacts how he or she is able to experience the world. So to me, that is the most important reason to get a clear diagnosis. And if you have the diagnosis, let's say of SAS, ASD or attention deficit or whatever, you know, it in some ways, again, compounds what that child's dealing with. When you think, oh, you know, they've already got two or three or four brain domains affected along with the ADHD. Wow, like that's huge. And it just gives us an opportunity to step back and say, you know, this person, this child that we love so much or teen or adult child needs us to be able to recognize today you know, their brain is kind of misfiring. And tomorrow, if it's a good day, you grab the moment. So I think really having that diagnosis helps you as a parent to do that. It also gives us power to advocate. Because again, when you're saying to a teacher who's, you know, got three kids in their class, and you know, your child's the one that's turtled under the desk and won't come out or is calling her name, whatever it is, to really share with them, what is FASD? What is happening to my child's brain? What can she or he do as a teacher that might help? Things that you've learned at home. So I do think it's important to have the diagnosis. The other reason is that it gives you a platform to talk and teach your loved one about who they are a person. So to be able to say to them, no, this is what, what happened today. It's because, you know, the FASD changed your brain when, when the alcohol was in your, you know, impacting your brain. It, you know, it caused your memory to um, have some problems. So I know you're forgetting these math problems for the 10th time. We're going to keep at it because, you know, one of the accommodations that helps memory is repeat, 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 repeat. So, you know, you're able to say to your child, you can learn. You just learn differently. It takes a little more time. We have to have a little more patience and we can go over that and we can help your memory to work. It takes the feeling of um, self-blame off the child or off teen or, or adult. And I've heard stories as, as I, I uh, work with adults who talk about how relieved they felt when they finally got a diagnosis because they realized for the first time in their lives at 20 or or 30 and one gentleman I met was in his 50s and and he expressed I I suddenly understood that I was not a loser that you know I had a reason that I had these struggles and it wasn't because I was lazy or stupid or defiant or whatever it's because I had a brain injury that nobody recognized so even a late life diagnosis can so when we go back to the topic of this evening and look into health, many of our people um, struggle with mental health issues and struggle with self esteem and self worth and self value because they've gotten the message over their lifetime as short or as long as it is that they don't they don't fit in. So it impacts mental health over the time, you know, that, that they have those experiences. So when they get a diagnosis, or we as parents finally get the diagnosis, we can take it to them with that lens and say, let me teach you about how amazing you are in these areas. And, and you know, so you have trouble with memory or, or you, you fidget all the time. What can we do to help with that? And it just really turns things around when it comes to mental health, when somebody can say, you know, actually, it's not my fault. So that's, that's, uh, I think I just went on a soapbox there. So we'll okay. go <laughs> I just, I do just want to be mindful of time because we have about half an hour left. Yes. Um, we have two other questions. So I'm, I'm wondering if uh, for those two questions, if we can just pause those for a couple seconds and Joyce, um, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all the slides this evening. So 
Um, maybe I'll mute myself if you just want to let me know what next slide um, you'd like to go to and I will compile all the questions we have. Well, just, them. Yeah, sure. Let's just go through them and I'll speed up a little bit. It's, you know, I think it, it speaks to how complex this whole topic it is, right? Absolutely. So we'll just go in, in the order and then I'll see if, you know, and some of them I, I may have addressed in, in what I just said, you know. So we'll just go to the next slide. Okay, so these ones I can go through a little bit quickly and you guys will be able to read these on, on your own. But really the question here is FASD and mental health, you know, is, it, is there a connection? So the next couple of slides are really about um, some studies that have been done. And in fact, no surprise, it does prove that um, people who are diagnosed with FASD have much higher prevalences of having health problems or disorders. So, I mean, these are specific, um, and I've cited them, so if you were interested and you wanted to go in a little bit deeper, you could certainly look up these studies, but, um, you know, just looking at some of the numbers off the top here, like children, um, like in the O'Connor study, um, it demonstrated that children who were exposed were, eight, you know, 87% more likely to, to end up with a psychiatric disorder. And that, again, is a tertiary effect. It's not that they're born with that. It's just that the ongoing stress of struggling with FASD often leads to poorer mental health over time. So therefore, the risk increases. So pretty much all of these studies showed that kind of outcome. So you can go to the next slide. And, and the same thing. These are just other studies. And again, in some of them are Canadian, which is great. I try to find studies that are relevant to our own, um, our own country. But in 2004, 92% of adults with FASD did have a, a mental disorder in in the particular study. And again, it was linked to higher rates of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Depression and anxiety come up in almost every study. And so those are the two, they, they are considered the two most common mental health disorders that are linked directly to FASD. And, and again, if you think about um, uh, depression and anxiety and living with that chronically over time, many adults with FSD in some of these studies, like 23%, which is a fairly high number, had attempted suicide. And it's because they were more likely to have the, the secondary factor of mental health or substance abuse and things like that, or the history of trauma and abuse. Um, and then then again, looking at where their supports are, you know, if they're struggling financially. And we know people don't live well on ODSP or Ontario Works. And unless you're, you know, from a family who's able to supplement that, life can be pretty hard. We also know people with FASD are often, you know, struggle socially. So they don't always have a strong social support network. So those, those factors contribute to the increased likelihood of, you know, more serious uh, mental health issues. You can go to the next slide. Um, so again, I already addressed this. The two most common mental health issues are depression and anxiety. And again, um, this is a, based on a Canadian study around uh, the prenatal exposure to to uh, alcohol, what um, Dr. Weinberg discovered is really there are permanent changes to the hypothalamic pituitary and adrenal axis, and that's the endocrine system. So that involves your adrenals and um, your thalamic system, your pituitary glands and all that. So again, it just stresses that there are physical changes that happen when people are prenatally exposed. And this is part of the endocrine system, which has a direct impact on mood and that kind of thing. So you end up more likely with depression and anxiety and that kind of stuff. So it's interesting to think that that is not just, um, uh, you know, because life is tough, but there are also physical or chemical reasons in the brain that that happens. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so, so when we look at, and this ties into a little bit about the question around um, ASD, but the nature of FASD does make it quite complex 
we talk it, about it being an invisible disability, the fact that it can be difficult to recognize and also diagnose and or treat compared to maybe some other disabilities. And I've talked about the fact it's a permanent brain injury. We know that the majority of people who are diagnosed and or suspected, but diagnosed with FASD, don't have the sentinel fa facial features. And that actually increases the risk because, again, I'll put it in quotes, they look normal. And so the expectations of people around them are that, well, you look normal and, and lots of our people have great verbal skills, so you talk normal, so therefore you're normal. And, and those expectations of, you know, being normal are put on our kids and, and our teens and, and our adult children, and they can't sustain it, right? So um, it's, it, makes it, uh, it makes it more difficult sometimes to intervene. Um, and again, even, you know, in my last comment here, even, even for those who are really high on the spectrum, and may not have those sentinel features, it just really sets that person up really of not being able to function uh, without really ongoing and intense guidance and supervision, even into the adult years and beyond, but people are not recognizing it. So that's also another great reason to have a diagnosis um, and teach your child, uh, you know, kind of weave it in and and again this would be a strategy and i've used with my um uh, all my children but my two older ones they, it was just woven in it became a natural part of the conversation i had my youngest boy at um the eye doctor yesterday he was he's having some visual problems and it's it sometimes can be a, a, an outcome of the asd so just very casually and calmly saying to the eye doctor, oh, I just, you know, wasn't sure if you knew Jaden had a, di oops, I just used his name, Jay had a, a diagnosis of FASD. And the doctor right away said, okay, we're going to do a few extra tests here because he was aware that vision could be impacted. But but what my my son is hearing is just the natural kind of, oh, yeah, I just want you to know this. This is also about him, you know, and and so by the time they're getting older, they're quite comfortable most often, not always, because again, we can't generalize. They're fairly comfortable to say, yes, this is something that I've been diagnosed with, or they can choose not to, but it just makes it more um, woven into their, their uh, life history, really. Next slide. So I wanted to just quickly mention trauma because I don't think can look at this without mentioning trauma. And, and um, I just did a direct quote here by uh, Teresa Kellerman um, and she was a big advocate um, and, uh, and an adoptive parent uh, and runs uh, the, the, the FASD programs out of, this, out of the States. But I thought this was a great quote. You know, when a baby is born with other disabilities like Down syndrome or spina bifida, heart defects, prematurity, etc., there's often instant family and community and professional support. The extended family gather around the new parents. They offer support and encouragement. Services are engaged. Programs are set up. Intervention often begins almost immediately. But the baby born with FASD is, is born into an environment that is often fraught with addiction or domestic violence or abuse or neglect or poverty and later surrounded, let's say, with kinship care by overwhelmed relatives or the chaos in confusion. Many of our children have experienced that foster care system and they're moved and moved and it's uncertain. It's, you know, there's a lot of instability around that. So by the time the children are finally, if they are adopted, they've now also been exposed to and experienced many adverse childhood events. So also dealing with developmental trauma concurrently with FASD. So it's, I think, important for us and, and you know, to, to really be aware of that and, uh, and look at how trauma impacts that over time. And as I said, that would be a whole other webinar, but it's important to at least remember, it's not just the FASD, it's, it's all the factors that we've talked about so far. So let's move on. So what's a mental health crisis? Um, it's, uh, well, 
I wonder if I can, Catherine, see this link here? If you can click on it and open the hyperlink, usually it, it's, it's a, a, a very, it's a three minute little film that's really quite good that describes what a mental health crisis is in relation to a young man who is talking to his psychiatrist about um, uh, having schizoid affect, which is uh, a type of mental health disorder. But I want you to just listen for the mental health crisis if it will open. On mine, I just, I just need to stop sharing and reshare my screen to the okay. channel. So if you guys can just bear with me for one second as I do that. And I believe I have to unmute myself as well. So, okay, um, okay. I'm going to share this. There's, it's it's going to pop up as a commercial, but <laughs> it's the right link. We're not we're not selling glasses. <laughs> yeah. We should be able to skip the ad. It says skip now in the little blue. Yeah. Oh, is this it? No. What's going? On? I don't know what happened there. Oh, sorry. This, let me try it again one more time. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to um, click on the link and hopefully that will get us to the right. And if, if we can't get, I can just quickly define what a mental health crisis is. Right. I'm going to Benjamin. Just before I was talking. Okay. Yeah, I got it. it. I'm yeah. recognizing. <laughs> okay. Let me try and reshare. I don't know what I was sharing, but okay. Let me reshare this for you. No, it's just to affect Order. Yeah, this is what a mental health crisis. To find out what exactly a mental health crisis is and what you can do if you find yourself in one, I've been talking with Dr. Ran Singh. So, what is a mental health crisis? A crisis is any point where your mental health worsens to an extent where you either need additional or urgent help. And you, you might not have a diagnosed mental health. Problem. It's just got to a point where things have got out of control. And there's kind of different kinds of mental health crisis. You might be experiencing suicidal ideas or behavior. You might have psychotic symptoms where you kind of, I suppose, lose your touch or your, your grip on reality. You might have extreme anxiety or panic attacks or any other kind of behavior that's out of control. The important thing is that whilst a crisis is scary and terrifying for most people and those around them, it can actually be a turning point because it might sometimes, unfortunately, need a crisis for you to think, I need to get help or whatever I'm on isn't working. And if it's handled the right way, it can be a really positive experience, it can be a positive outcome to it, but it has to be dealt with the right way. The important thing is that when you have a crisis, you've got to tell someone and you've got to seek out help. What can you immediately do if you're having a mental health crisis? And the really, like, the crux of it is that you've got to speak up. You've got to ask for help. You've got to a point where you can't handle things by yourself. And that help might come from people around you, so your support network, your friends and family. It might come from a, uh, an advisory or advice service, so you might call someone, so like a, a specific help line, NHS 111, or the Samaritans or the Mind Helpline, they may or may not be able to help you at that point. Or you might want to seek out a professional service. So for instance, a community mental health team, a crisis team, your GP or a &E. um, Whichever help you go to may not be able to sort you out entirely, but they should also be able to point you in the right direction if you need extra care. And some people, if they um, experience this frequently or a lot, they do they, they plan in advance. So they might make up something called a crisis card. So that's a little card that sits in your wallet and on that it says it's an instruction to yourself to say basically this is the person you need to call, this is the place you need to go, and if I'm in a crisis this is what I want to happen to me. It's a really useful thing to have just because in that moment you're not going to be potentially thinking, you know, like you normally do or thinking straight and you just need something quick and easy to go to. Okay, please bear me with me as I, as I switch back over to the slide. Okay, so can, I, can you can hear me now? There are yeah. stories. Oh.
Oh. <laughs> so I think again, and I really want to uh, stress is it is not hopeless when your child um, or again, teen or, or adult child presents with mental health issues or illness or psychiatric psychiatric disorder. So the, the main protective factors in um, not just in kind of having changes with a child or a person with FASD over time, but also mental health is, um, you know, through the research, it's living in a good quality home. And by that, we just mean um, having regular structures, regular routines, consistent boundary setting, consistent limits, consistent uh, discipline, so that um, there is a really uh, safe feeling around uh, the person. So I'm not talking good quality as in a rich family, because we can have rich families who don't necessarily have uh, a, a good quality structure routine set up. So it's looking at how a family is organized. The few changes living situations. So again, you know, I spoke earlier about um, some, for some of our kids, it's tough because they've been in the foster care system. Again, for my oldest son, he had, he had lived in about 13 uh, foster homes and maybe about five, six different group homes by the time he came to live with us permanently. But, you know, at age 12, he had had you know, really a lot of chaos in his whole upbringing. But when he got to us, you know, it was a, a fairly structured home, routines were clear, um, boundaries were clear, so on and so forth. And, and he's now in, in, in his mid 30s. And, um, and actually doing quite well. So, you know, if we can keep uh, kind of minimize the chaos or the upsets or the changes of home and schools and communities and things like that and keep it consistent, that is a protective factor. Um, obviously not being exposed to ongoing violence or abuse or neglect, things like that. Uh, receiving support services for any developmental disabilities that may or may not be uh, a part of their um, their makeup and and again the earlier the diagnosis is is better and that's no different than for any developmental disability or physical disability or it's no different for FASD or mental health or psychiatric disorders obviously the earlier something's recognized diagnosed then the earlier intervent interventions can happen and so there's a longer period of time where help is offered so the other thing that I, I added on my own is just that caregivers who are mentally and emotionally healthy who also have support would would add as a protective factor because obviously as caregivers if we're solid and we're calm and we've kind of got it together as best as we can the ch it, it helps the person feel more safe and and more secure so the key notes from the video that you just heard was early intervention is best you have to talk about it you have to seek help um, having the information or crisis card on the person um, so if if in a time of crisis they don't have to talk they can literally hand the police officer or you know first responder an ambulance paramedic driver or something a card that says you know i'm diagnosed with fasd i also struggle with depression and anxiety call my mother here's her phone number or father or aunt or whoever their contact person is, you know, I live at this address. It just takes the pressure off of the person who's in a crisis of having to talk or explain, and it gives immediate information to the responders. Can you go to the next slide, Catherine? Um, so what can we do to proactively support mental health? Number one is we have to self-care. It's vital. And I know that sounds hokey and you're kind of thinking, how do I self-care in the midst of utter chaos? But it really is important. Um, you know, you use that example of, you know, the airplane mask. If, if the oxygen mask comes down, you put it on yourself first. Because the bottom line is if you don't and you pass out or you die, you're not helping the person who's beside you in the seat. And it's the same way as parents. If we 
really don't care for ourselves over time we're not going to be able to care for our loved one who who does take a lot of uh, emotional and physical energy um, structure and routine um, helping with time management or daily routines one of the most effective ways um, that people intervene or professionals intervene with people who struggle with depression and anxiety is getting them to work out a really um, solid routine day by day. So when you're depressed, you don't feel like getting out of bed. But if you have a, a routine that's, you know, uh, the same every day, you get up at nine, you go brush your teeth, you have uh, your, you know, a younger child, your milk and cereal or an older person, a coffee and, you know, toast or whatever it is, it sounds so simple, you're thinking that doesn't make a difference. But in fact, it does. So time management, daily routines that are predictable, make people feel safe, they know what's expected, they know what to do. So uh, that's really, really important as an as a, a strategy, monitoring social relationships at school and, and in the community at large. So again, um, a lot of people who aren't feeling great about who they are, will gravitate to anyone who kind of accepts them. So if as parents, we can proactively set up, let's say for younger children, play dates with, with children we know, you know, uh, if are well behaved or come from solid families or whatever it is, it helps. And with our teens, you know, have the party at your house because you know how to interact with your child uh, or teen if he or she is getting overstimulated or overwhelmed, that kind of thing. Try to um, shape the social relationships um, that are happening for your loved one. And then strategic supports in your community. Uh, we have here in, in the Ottawa area and in, in our outlying area um, uh, around the region, we have the FASD worker program. Um, and, and workers will, will come alongside of you and offer support. Independent facilitation is, is again, having somebody, this is more maybe older people, teen, like older teens and young adults, where they'll get one one support from people who will help facilitate how they want to live their life, what goals they want to set. Do they want to go to college after high school or do they want to, you know, uh, to go on an apprenticeship course? Do they want to live on their own or in their parents' basement? Like things like that, helping them set their own goals so that they can have a sense of choice and control over their own life. You know, counseling, obviously, your family doctor, or if, if your child does get to a point where psychiatric intervention is required. So you're looking for those types of supports. And I've already spoken to the next point, just teaching your loved one about their diet diagnosis, how and why their brain functions like it does. It helps them to really understand who they are and move towards accepting themselves for who they are as unique beings. So the FASD, you know, and, and or mental health is one part of who they are. So education, um, uh, knowledge really is power and and that is the same for our loved ones with the diagnosis. So in, informing them about what this is all about and always focusing on strengths, because if we always look at the negatives, why did you do that? Or, oh, you forgot that. Or, oh, you, you know, you didn't do what I asked. Or, you know, you did three things, but I asked you for four things. It becomes a negative kind of uh, where the person sinks into low self-esteem. No matter what I do, I always mess up on something. So if you're focusing on the strengths that at an age, you know, appropriate level, you know, wow, you put your clothes into the dirty hamper. Like that's good job, you know, good for you. So you're focusing on that. Um, and obviously, I'm sure many of us already have working with our school personnel. We have to ask and if you need help advocating, there are services um, like us, the Adopt for Life group. We will go out. We will advocate with you and for your loved one in, in the school system. We will teach the teachers. The Fetal Alcohol Resource Program will, will also will do that with workers if FASD is more of an issue 
um, than let's say the the adoption history or the trauma and and certainly both groups can do both so really we have to teach the teachers we have to work with the people in your your church family or guiding and scouting groups coaches we can go out and do that so really one of the most powerful ways is to break down the stigma overall and the misunderstanding so that our loved ones don't have to be embarrassed or ashamed that and and we don't as parents we are saying this this whole thing is one part you know of who our who our loved one is so let's go to the next slide so i do want to be mindful we have about five or ten minutes left yeah uh, i think closer to five minutes uh, oh no a little bit more than five minutes i do uh, we did have a few questions that are popping up so for those who are asking questions i think this information is pivotal that joyce is sharing so if you um i've sent my email address for those who've asked questions please feel free to email them to me um, for those who are on Facebook Live, you can email us at info at adoptforlife.com and we absolutely will um, make sure to follow up. I just don't want us to lose any of this information that Joyce is giving us as well. Um, so these ones I can go through really quickly actually because they are basic, but I think sometimes we forget how important they are. So it's food and healthy diet, you know, eating together, research shows when you have dinner together, it does reduce the risk of mental health and it does increase emotional well-being. So, you know, you think, oh, whoop de do eating dinner together in, and we have a busy, busy world. If you can do it even a few times a week, if you're not doing it at all now, aim for once or twice. If you're doing it for once or twice, aim for three times. It makes a difference. And, and obviously healthy food, you know, and sleep is important. It's important for mental health. Um, again, research shows that if you're not getting adequate sleep, the risk for depression and anxiety increases. Um, you know, things like don't have technology devices in the bedroom. I know I can't you but I know you're all rolling your eyes at me right now <laughs> and you're going right so one of the things that I did because I could not successfully get the devices out of the bedroom is I just used black electrical tape and I covered all the little lights the blue light effect then at least it's dark once they turn it off and you're not getting the blue light effect which is known to disrupt sleep so so just little things you can do just to try to improve sleep, getting blackout curtains like Giant Tiger sells them 10 bucks a panel. It makes a difference if the room is nice and dark, if your child's not dealing with other issues like trauma where they're afraid, you know, so you have to, again, be mindful of, of what sort of things you're doing for your specific child. But uh, those are very important things that impact uh, overall mental health in a positive way. Next slide exercise again I can see everyone rolling their eyes but if we get our kids out and and again I mean, surprise surprise there's all kinds of new research coming out those of us who are out in nature and just sitting in the trees we are mentally more healthy than those who are you know in the classrooms in our offices and things like that so again um, you know physical activity activity gets those happy hormones going in the brain in a natural way and it reduces risk for depression nature does as well it reduces depression and so does social interaction and so sometimes our children who have acceptance are not always socially invited places or to birthday parties so if we can create social situations for them we need to do that um, and the whole issue of, of technology and screen time I've just recommended a book here if you if you have time to read and your busy schedules there's a great book called glow kids um, and um, it's 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 just a great resource to read and learn about uh, what screen time and technology does. And, and I'm not advocating that you take all technology away from your children. I think that there would be negative effects to that too. I think we just need to learn about and be cognizant and, and help our children and youth and adult uh, loved ones have a balance and find different interests. So there's screen time, outdoor time, family time, you know, uh, gym time whatever it is so that it's a balance they can still have their technology it's the when and how long and things like that next slide so 
eight, eight magic keys is a strategy. Um, and I've actually talked right through all of these strategies throughout the presentation, being simple and concrete in your directions, being consistent uh, with routines, with rules. The more wishy-washy we are, the hard is for our kids to really understand what we're expecting of them. You know, repeat, repeat, repeat in different ways, in simple, concrete ways, but the same message. Keeping things simple, keeping your routines, being very specific, um, that kind of thing. They seem simple, and they are simple, but they are um, very effective in terms of dealing both with behavior, but also in preventing depression and anxiety and, and uh, uh, other mental health issues. Next slide. And then strategies for, for talking. Again, I talked about relationship. You need to start talking to your child, youth or adult child as early as possible. If you are suspecting a mental health issue, um, it's, it's like any other exception. The earlier you figure it out, the better it is. So if you're developing relationship with your loved one, um, hopefully you are able to introduce conversation and just be very real. You know, I'm worried about you. You seem a little sad these days you know is there anything going on I want you to know I'm here for you um, they may blow you off but it, it they're still getting a message you're aware you're being mindful you're there for them so you're planting those seeds of relationship validating their feelings you know when they say I hate school it sucks everybody's bullying me um, it's not always great to say well, what can you do better to be nicer so your friends don't ditch you? You know, and sometimes as parents, we're frustrated. And sometimes people just need to be validated. I know school is really difficult for you. You know, I'm so proud that you're going, even though you tell me, I mean, my son's case, he used the word torture. He, he said to me, why do you send me out every day to be tortured? And I just said, wow, you're feeling tortured at school. I'm so sad to hear that. That must be so hard for you. And it's just like, it sure is, mom. You know what happened today? And then they're, they're giving you more information. And confronting the scary issues. Like really, if you have a teen that you really think is maybe contemplating suicide or self-harm or trying drugs or whatever, you need, to con you need to talk to them about it and you need to say it. You're not going to encourage them to go out and do it. But, you know, if you've heard something or seen something or found a note, you need to just honestly say, you know, I am so scared right now because I heard you saying to your, you know, your friend on the phone that you don't want to live life anymore. And, you know, that's a big statement. That's a heavy duty statement. I would be devastated. Can we talk about that? It opens the door for the conversation. And, and we can't take it personally. So again, a lot of the behaviors, um, are not purposeful. Some of them are related directly to the FASD domain. But in terms of the mental health, when your child says, you know, uh, life just sucks, I don't want to live anymore, it's hard not to feel as a parent or ask ourselves a question, where did I fail? Mental health health or illness is an illness. It's not your fault. It's not the person's fault. It's about all those factors, right? So we have to decide and just hear the hard words and say, love you. We're going to get you the help you need. And then you seek help. Next slide. So, so just asking yourself the question, you know, have you helped or have you access help in the past? What was useful or what, what was not useful? So, um, you know, just remind yourself, who did I reach out to before? What doctor listened to me? What psychiatrist listened to me? What teacher at the school? You know, your, your child may be in grade now, but if they had a teacher in grade seven who was great, can you email her and say, hey, do you have any ideas about this? You know, just really think about who your sports are. Next slide. So these slides, I'm they're just possible helps for you. I'm not going to go through them one by one. You can read them. 
So on our video, the video saying health crisis, the guy said no one one one. It's because it was from Australia. And so obviously in Ontario, we dial nine one one for any type of emergency. I've just done charts here, and I've pinned it down to kind of helps for children, youth, and adults in relation to mental health. So I think those are the next two slides as well, Kathleen. You can just go through those. Yeah, and the next one. Yeah. And the next one, we'll go to the next one. So, so the last thing I think as we wrap up is I want to just talk about the power of language. When you are seeking help, when you find yourself, you know, calling the police, or calling uh, a crisis center or going to CHEO, let's say to the emergency department, or if you're dealing with older kids, whether it's here in Ottawa, the, the general, whatever. As advocates for our people, we do have to think about our tone of voice, the words we use, and the things that we say to people. So tone of voice really being calm um, and sounding, <laughs> sounding sane yourself, not getting angry. It's hard sometimes when you're calling for help and you don't feel like people are responding. It's hard not to sound frustrated or angry or attacking, but it's really powerful when you can stay calm and state the facts. And so with the words you use, if you can try to remember not to be overly emotional, but to say, I want to describe what is happening right now in my home. So concrete example, I have had to call police many times over the years uh, for my own safety and for the safety of my children. So when I call, I say, I'm calling about a domestic situation but my child or youth, whoever I was calling about at the time, has a diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and severe anxiety disorder and uh, depression. I'm asking you to come and help. I'm asking you to do no harm. I'm asking you to support me as a parent to get my child or youth help or to get them to a crisis bed and I need your help. So, so when you go through that, there again, the, the responders have a different lens. It's different if you're calling and you're saying, and you're freaking out and you're saying, oh my God, getting punched, really come. My kid's 17, he's out of control. I need your help. Then they're gonna respond like there's a serious domestic violence situation happening. And in fact, you know, yes, there is, but it's happening because someone has a has a permanent brain injury or they're um, so depressed that they want to self harm or whatever's going on. So when you think about the words you use, you want to be as factual as you can be and you want to be saying to the police or ambulance or whoever you're calling, this is the help I'm asking for. So they actually come to you already prepared knowing what it is you're asking for as opposed to coming into an unknown situation. Safety is always going to be first for them them you don't want them to draw their guns um, so you know if you can think about that and sometimes think ahead of time many of us deal with those aggressive situations on an ongoing basis so over time we can actually have a, a, a plan of what we want to say I know we're running out of time next um, so these are just tips that are actually uh, presented by the uh, Crisis Prevention Institute, and they're very similar to the things that I've already been saying, using as few words as possible. Keep it simple and concrete. Stay calm. You're not arguing or debating or negotiating in this moment. You cannot argue with somebody or, or have a logical discussion with somebody who is out of control and not thinking properly and and their mind is scattered they can't problem solve in the moment so you know you you just have to be as calm as you can and if we can remember in our case because many of our loved ones have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder their developmental age is different from their biological or chronological age so we have to remember if our child's 15 but functioning at a five level we need to be speaking at that level so they can understand 
and we're trying to be non-judgmental. So again, not taking it personally. If your teen is saying, I want to die, and you say, oh my God, how can you say that? I've been the best parent in the world, and what a slap in the face to me. You're being judgmental, and you have to just hear them out, validate their feelings, and say, we're going to get you the support and the help you need. If you can get a few yes answers where they might say to you, yes, I need help, or yes, I'll go to the emergency, or whatever it is, that's great. And, and of course, in terms of your own safety, being mindful of the nonverbal communication. You know your child. I said right at the beginning, you are the expert. So if you know, and again, I'll give a concrete example. I did call police for help one day, and I said to them very calmly, my child is is going to harm me tonight. I know him. I'm watching his body. He's going to punch me. And I said, I'm trying to get help ahead of time. Can you, I, I said, I asked the police officer the question, are you going to wait for me to be punched in the face in order for me to have help? Or can you come here now, do no harm and help defuse the situation? And they sent an officer and it was great. And, and, you know, so we're trying to be as proactive as we can. Next slide. In the crisis, safety for, the, for your child, for yourself, and for the first responders always comes first. So, I mean, there's no guarantees here that if your child or youth or adult is still, you know, flipping, that an officer might not pin him or her down or God forbid, taser them or, or cuff them if they feel they have to protect themselves from physical assault. So the priority really always is immediate safety. And so we have to be cognizant of that. But when we call for help, what we say, how we say it can often prevent things from escalating to the point where somebody's going to have to, you know, be manhandled. Next. That's it. So I think I was had a thank you slide and just said if there's any more questions. I really appreciate um, you taking the time out tonight. It's a really important topic and probably we could do weeks, a course for weeks on this topic, right? That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Joyce. You didn't pause and you even take a drink of water. So I think that alone uh, deserves some applause. You're always a wealth of knowledge for all of us. And again, for those of you who may have had questions that didn't ask, because I know this was just a lot of great information, please feel free to reach out to your regional parent liaison or to us at info at adoptforlife.com and we will be more than happy to, to support you and answer any questions you have. Joy and the, and the fetal alcohol resource program too in your area for sure. And we work together very closely, you know, because unfortunately for, for our adoptive children, many of them have, um, you know, exceptions. So we're, we're there uh, as well, you know. Absolutely. Very important to know. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. I know all of us here, we're getting some really good comments saying that it was a very great webinar, very informative. So I think it's very well received. Have an amazing night, everybody. And um, bye. Everyone. Bye. Hey, take care. Bye.